Welcome AP Biology students. This is Unit 6, Topic 4. We're going to focus specifically on the mechanism of translation. Uh, translation is the second part of protein synthesis. So the first part we looked at in depth last week uh, or, or last class, that was transcription. Now we're going to take that messenger RNA transcript and we're going to translate it into a polypeptide chain, which ultimately will end up becoming a protein of some sort. So translation itself is the synthesis of a polypeptide using information from the messenger RNA transcript. Remember that a polypeptide from our unit one in biochemistry, a polypeptide is a long sequence chain of amino acids. Um, typically, uh, you have a uh, an amino acid, then two amino acids, a dipeptide, three amino acids joined together as a tripeptide, Four or more is when we consider it a, a polypeptide. And when you start to get up to around 100 or so amino acids, that's when we truly get to see uh, protein formation. Remember that transla uh, translation, because we're making proteins, is going to occur at ribosomes. And ultimately, a nucleotide sequence is going to determine the amino acid sequence of that polypeptide chain. The molecule that comes into play here, along with messenger RNA, is going to be tRNA. And tRNA is a key player in translation because uh, um, tRNA is going to help translate that messenger RNA into some sort of amino acid sequence. And if you look at tRNA here, you're going to have the anticodon that's going to match up with the messenger RNA's triplet code that we refer to as a codon. And up here at the top of the transfer RNA molecule is where we have that amino acid attachment point. So you have a bunch of these little hairpin loops. Down here is the anticodon end, and up here is where that amino acid would attach. So T tRNA has an anticodon, and basically the anticodon region is complementary to and antiparallel to the messenger RNA. So remember that the messenger RNA down here has the codons. The three nucleotides are read in triplet code called a codon. And this is going to be 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So the complementary tRNA anticodon is going to run 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So in the messenger RNA where we have an A, in tRNA we're going to get a U. In, in messenger RNA where there's a C, we're going to get a G in the tRNA. And in the messenger RNA we have a U. And in the tRNA we're going to get an A. Remember that RNA does not have thymine, it has uracil in place of it. So tRNA carries the amino acid that the messenger RNA codon codes for. Um, ACU codes for threonine, and you can see it right here. That's the abbreviation for that particular amino acid. Um, ultimately, uh, what students get confused with is often when you start to throw in that tRNA anticodon in there, they start to use that anticodon in the genetic code to look up the amino acid that would come into play. That is a huge mistake. Do not do that. Um, what you always want to do is look up the messenger RNA's codon in the genetic code to determine the amino acid that's coming into play. So if you were to look up the first base of A, second base C, and the third base U, that codon ACU would translate into this particular amino acid called threonine, which is abbreviated THR. So the enzyme uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase is responsible for attaching those amino acids to transfer RNA. When tRNA carries an amino acid, it is charged. So now we have that transfer RNA molecule being charged because it has that amino acid threonine attached to it. So if we take a look at the structure of ribosomes, remember that ribosomes are not membrane-bound organelles. So ribosomes are found in both prokaryotic cells and in eukaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, ribosomes can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, making it the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or they can be found free-floating as loose ribosomes in the cytoplasm region of the cell. And in prokaryotes, it would be found in the cytoplasm region of the cell as well. So ribosomes are our protein-making factories of the cell, and that's where translation occurs, because this is where we're going to build the protein. 
So ribosomes together have two subunits, a small subunit and a large subunit. Prokaryotic and eukaryotic ribosomal subunits do differ in size. Um, when you think about the prokaryotic cell, which is a bacteria cell, the uh, basic size of a ribosome, the smaller subunit is 30s and the large subunits in about 40s. Um, when you talk about the eukaryotes, that smaller subunit is going to be in the 40s range and the larger subunit is going to be in, in the 60s range. The large subunit in a, in a ribosome is going to have three sites that are referred to as the A site, the P site, and the E site. And each of those letters does stand for something, so there is significance there. So the A site is going to be the amino acid site. So when the messenger RNA feeds in, um, that tRNA molecule is going to come in, bring that amino acid into the A site of the ribosome. It's going to hold the next tRNA carrying that amino acid until the one moves, this one would move out of position. So that A site will hold this one that's coming in until that one moves out of position. In the P site, the P stands for polypeptide. So here you can see that growing amino acid chain or polypeptide chain coming out of the ribosome. It's going to hold the tRNA carrying the growing polypeptide chain. And eventually, once this uh, amino acid gets attached to the growing polypeptide chain, then this tRNA molecule will move over to the exit site. And E stands for exit site. Ultimately, then that one would, that's where the tRNA molecules exit. So the amino acid sites where they come in, the P sites where you have that growing polypeptide chain, and the E sites where the tRNA molecules are going to exit. So let's quickly do a quick check here. Um, read the question, pause the pause your computer for a minute, think about it, and then click play to hear the correct answer. So how does the tRNA interact with messenger RNA? The answer is through the anticodon. So remember that the messenger RNA has the codon and the uh, tRNA has the complementary antiparallel anticodon there. Our next question there would be, uh, what codes for the amino acid? So if we think about what codes for the amino acid, we're going to have to go with the messenger RNA's codon. That is what you're going to look up in the genetic code. Do not get confused and start looking up the, um, the anticodon of the transfer RNA. Thirdly, uh, what are the three sites on the large ribosome, rib ribosomal subunits? The three sites are the A site, which stands for the amino acid site, the P site, which stands for the polypeptide site, and the E site, which stands for exit. All right, let's continue on with our lecture here, now that we did a little quick check. Continuing on with translation. Translation occurs in three basic stages, and these three basic stages are what we refer to as initiation, elongation, and termination. Let's take a look very quickly at each of these three stages, and then we'll start to wrap up um, our, our discussion here on translation. So initiation. Initiation begins when translation, initiation begins, so translation begins when the small ribosomal subunit binds to messenger RNA and a charge transfer RNA binds to the start codon, AUG. AUG is the codon that's going to code for the amino acid methionine. So all of your polypeptide chains are going to start with the amino acid uh, methionine because AUG is the start codon there. The tRNA uh, carries methionine which is abbreviated MET. Next, the large subunit binds. And when the large subunit binds, then that's when we bring everything together. So the first tRNA carrying the thionine will go to the P site directly. Every other tRNA that comes into play will first visit this A site here. Remember that that amino acid site is going to hold the next tRNA molecule until the one in position in the P site gets bumped over to the E site to be exited. The next step would be elongation. 
Um, this would be elongating the polypeptide chain. So elongation starts when the next transfer RNA molecule moves into the A site of the ribosome. Messenger RNA is moved through the ribosome and its codons are read. Each messenger RNA codon codes for a specific amino acid that you can look up in the genetic code. The codon charts are used to determine the amino acid sequence of a growing polypeptide chain. Since all organisms use the same genetic code, it supports the idea of common ancestry when we think about living things evolving from that single, um, single organism. So as elongation continues, uh, you have this codon recognition, step one. The appropriate anticodon of the next tRNA goes to the A site. The pop, pop peptide bond is going to form. The peptide bonds are formed that uh, peptide bonds are formed that transfer the polypeptide to the A site of the tRNA. Remember that peptide bonds are the bonds that are created from biochemistry in unit one when you have a dehydration synthesis reaction. Translocation ultimately then is when the transfer RNA in the A site moves to the P site. So you're going to translocate that amino acid. The tRNA in the P site goes to the E site and the A site is open for the next transfer RNA molecule. So you're going to keep these things moving along until eventually a stop codon comes into play. And when that stop codon comes into play, that's when we reach the third step of translation, which is known as termination. So termination occurs when a stop codon in the messenger RNA reaches the A site of the ribosome. Stop codons do not code for any particular amino acid. The stop codon signals for a release factor. And then ultimately, um, when that release factor uh, happens, you're going to hydrolyze the bond that holds the polypeptide to the P site. So ultimately, by hydrolyzing it, then that means the polypeptide can be released from the P site. And ultimately, then all translational units, when we talk about those small units and subunits coming together as far as the ribosome, can now begin to disassemble. There are three stop codons that can come into play to indicate the termination of this entire process. So. Think pair share. Take a few minutes to review the three stages of translation with a partner. Well, instead of thinking about it with a partner, just think about this on your own. All right, let's do a quick review. Um, before we move on to protein folding, as now we have made that, that polypeptide, take a minute to review primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary protein structures from unit one biochemistry. Again, I couldn't stress enough how important that unit is. So primary is when you have a sequenced chain of amino acids. The secondary structure is when that, that primary structure starts to coil and fold due to hydrogen bonds forming. Then in the tertiary structure, you get those side chain interactions, especially when you get the alpha helix and the beta sheet in the secondary coils, and you start to get those disulfide bridges forming. You get these side chain interactions of the R groups of those amino acids. And then ultimately in the quaternary structure, you're going to have two or more polypeptide chains that are going to come together and interact to form the protein itself. So looking at protein folding, as translation takes place, the growing polypeptide chain begins to coil and fold. Genes are going to determine the primary st structure of the protein. And remember that in biology, um, primary structure is going to determine the final shape. And it's important to know that structure is equal to function. So some polypeptides require chaperone proteins to fold correctly. And some require modification before it can be functional in the cell. So ultimately, when we talk about chaperones, think about when you're on a field trip, you have a chaperone that's going to help guide you around wherever you're on a field trip to. Well, chaperone proteins are going to help guide that polypeptide into folding correctly and getting the modification it needs 
in order to become functional. So I will post this video as a tutorial in the um, unit folder for topic four, but kind of wrapping things up here, taking one final look at retroviruses. So retroviruses like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, are an exception to the standard flow of genetic information. And this is why it was so hard to back in the 80s when HIV AIDS came on the scene, 80s, early 90s. Um, it was hard to come up with a antiviral drug to combat this disease um, because they go against the norm of standard genetic information. Because when we talk about retroviruses, the information flows from RNA to DNA. And usually it's the reverse when you go from DNA to RNA. And ultimately, when you use that process going from RNA to DNA, you're going to use an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. So uh, when you talk about reverse transcriptase, it's going to couple the viral RNA to that particular DNA within the virus itself. And the DNA then becomes part of the ribonucleic acid molecule. So when we talk about the, the antiviral drugs for HIV, ultimately what you're doing is this reverse transcription to uh, those drugs are a cocktail of drugs to combat this reverse, trans, uh, reverse transcription process. All right, so closing up, we have practice FRQ. All living organisms need a transfer of information to allow for genes to direct the synthesis of proteins. Explain how genes are transcribed and translated to produce a functional protein. So that's question number one I want you to think about and then answer um, in your notes. And then question number two, Compare and contrast translation in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All right, that's it for topic four. I thank you for tuning in and um, give me your best. We are coming up on the end of, of unit six. So we're moving right along. We have a couple lab activities built in here. So uh, please make sure you keep up the notes so you understand what's going to happen in the labs. Thank you again, everyone, and have a nice day.